Welcome to History Sleuth, a podcast exploring the involvement of history and culture in current events. My name is Adelaide, and today we're going to talk about some present-day Black history, protests from Colin Kaepernick and the Black Lives Matter movement. But before we get into that, if you're on Twitter, follow me at Sleuth History to get updates about when I post new episodes, and make sure to follow History Sleuth on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you get your podcasts. I know it's not February anymore at the time that this will be posted, because my plants got all messed up from an ice storm in Texas, who could expect that? But um, we can still learn about and celebrate Black history in months that aren't February, so make sure you get connected so you can listen to any of the episodes in this series that you might have missed. Now, let's jump into some information about Colin Kaepernick. First off, who is Colin Kaepernick, and how does he relate to a discussion of Black history? Um, well, Wikipedia, you know, oftentimes is our, is our first source, and um, <laughs> it was definitely helpful for this topic as well. So Wikipedia says, Kaepernick is an American civil rights activist and football quarterback who is a free agent currently. He played six seasons for the San Francisco 49ers in the National Football League, NFL, obviously. In the 49ers' third preseason game in 2016, Kaepernick sat during the playing of the U.S. National Anthem prior to the game, rather than stand as customary, as a protest against racial injustice, police brutality, and systematic oppression in the country. The following week, throughout the regular season, Kaepernick kneeled during the anthem. The protests received highly polarized reactions, with some praising him and his stand against racism and others denouncing the protests. The actions resulted in a wider protest movement, which intensified in September 2017 after President Donald Trump said that the NFL owners should fire players who protest against the national anthem. Kaepernick became a free agent after the season and remained unsigned, which numerous analysts and observers have attributed to political reasons. In November 2017, he filed a grievance against the NFL and its owners, accusing them of colluding to keep him out of the league. Kaepernick withdrew the grievance in February 2019 after receiving a confidential settlement with the NFL. His protests received renewed attention in 2020 amid the George Floyd protests against police brutality and racism, but as of January 2021, he remains unsigned by any professional football team. Leading up to the 2016 season, Kaepernick was active in July on social media with social commentary about the fatal police shootings of Alton Sterling and Philando Castile, the police shooting of Charles Kisney, and the acquittal of the police in the death of Freddie Gray. In the 49ers' third preseason game of the season, reporter Steve Witch noted Kaepernick sitting down during the playing of the Star-Spangled Banner, as opposed to the tradition of standing. During a post-game interview, Kaepernick explained his position, stating, I am not going to stand up to show pride in a flag for a country that oppresses black people and people of color. To me, this is bigger than football, and it would be selfish on my part to look the other way. There are bodies in the street and people getting paid leave and getting away with murder referencing a series of African-American deaths caused by law enforcement that led to the Black Lives Matter movement, and adding that he would continue to protest until he feels like, quote, the American flag represents what it's supposed to represent. It had gone largely unnoticed that Kaepernick was also sitting during the anthem in the previous two weeks when he was inactive and not in uniform while recovering from injuries. In the 49ers' fourth and final preseason game, Kaepernick kneeled during the U.S. national anthem to show more respect to former and current military members, U.S. military members, while still protesting during the anthem after having a conversation with former NFL player and U.S. military veteran Nate Boyer. After the September 2016 police shootings of Terrence Crutcher and Keith Lamont Scott, Kaepernick commented publicly on the shooting, saying, This is the perfect example of what this is about. Photos then surfaced of him wearing socks, depicting police officers as pigs. In a statement, he acknowledged wearing them as a statement against quote-unquote rogue cops. He maintained that he has friends and family in law enforcement and that there are cops with quote good intentions who protect and serve and that he was not targeting all police. Kaepernick went on to kneel during the anthem prior to every 49ers game that season. After initial backlash against his protest, Kaepernick pledged to donate $1 million to quote organizations working in oppressed communities. He donated $25,000 to the Mothers Against Police Brutality organization that was started by Colette Flanagan, whose son fell victim to police brutality. In 2018, Kaepernick announced that he would make the final $100,000 donation of his million-dollar pledge in the form of $10,000 donations to charities that would be matched by celebrities. Inspired by Kaepernick, the other NFL players and pro athletes conducted various forms of silent protests during the national anthem. The NFL experienced an 8% decline in viewership in the 2016 season, with the number one reason, cited by 30% of fans in a J.D. Power survey, being player protests. His San Francisco teammates awarded him with the team's Len Eshmont Award as the player who best epitomized the inspirational and courageous play of former 49er Len Eshmont. Then 49ers head coach Kelly later said that Kaepernick was zero distraction that season. Also in 2016, Kaepernick and his partner, Nessa, founded the Know Your Rights Camp, an organization which held free seminars to disadvantaged youths to teach them about self-empowerment, American history, and legal rights. In April 2020, the Know Your Rights Camp launched a relief fund for individuals impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. 
Kaepernick donated $100,000 to the fund. In 2018, Nike released an ad featuring Kaepernick with the text, Believe in Something, even if it means sacrificing everything. NFL spokesperson Jocelyn Moore responded to the ad saying Kaepernick's social justice campaign, quote, deserves our attention and action. In July 2019, Nike released a shoe featuring the Betsy Ross flag called the Air Max One Quick Strike 4th of July trainers. The trainers were designed to celebrate Independence Day. The model was subsequently withdrawn after Colin Kaepernick told the brand that he and others found the flag offensive because they associated it with slavery. Joe Scarborough decried Nike's decision as politically correct madness, saying that the flag should be seen as a symbol of resistance against King George III. Scarborough also felt this instance of political correctness could help Donald Trump to be re-elected. Charles Taylor of Forbes described Nike's decision as a blunder, noting, noting that no significant number of Americans view the Betsy Ross flag as a racist symbol, and that a poll shows that 85% of American millennials like seeing the U.S. flag on Independence Day. Nike's decision to withdraw the product drew criticism from Arizona's Republican governor, Doug Ducey, who subsequently pulled a $2 million tax incentive for Nike factory in the state, and Texas's Republican Senator Ted Cruz. In June 2020, amid the George Floyd protests, the New York Times wrote that the NFL had wrestled with the issue of race, noting that three quarters of NFL players are African American, yet nearly every NFL team owner is white, and several are prominent Trump supporters. NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell put out a statement where he apologized for not listening to the concerns of African American players. The Times wrote that Goodell's, quote, words were panned as hypocritical because of the league's owner's rejections of Kaepernick. Michael Rosenberg of Sports Illustrated wrote, quote, Mainstream white America is going to reconsider Kaepernick at some point, the way it reconsidered Muhammad Ali after he refused to go to Vietnam, the way it reconsidered Jackie Robinson and Jack Johnson. Progress comes in fits and starts, and this country tends to punish those who urge it to move faster. The reconsideration of Kaepernick has begun. In August, after the shooting of Jacob Blake, a black man, Goodall said that he wished the NFL had listened earlier to Kaepernick's reasons for kneeling. Kaepernick supports the abolition of police and prisons. In October 2020, Kaepernick Publishing launched a project with Medium titled, quote, Abolition for the People, a collection of 30 essays written by several activists calling for police and prison abolition and criticizing prison reform as only, quote, reforming, reshaping, rebranding, end quote, systematic racism. So there's a lot there to take in already. And we're going to reflect on a lot of this in a minute. But but stuff I didn't write down in my notes that I was just thinking about currently. Um, I think the instance with the, the Betsy Ross flag is interesting maybe not the main thing that (laughs) we want to talk about right now but um it's not in my notes for later so i thought i'd just mention it while i was on my mind but i think that would be a really interesting thing to discuss and to press on further is that like does the the betsy ross flag one of the original american flags symbolize or connect to slavery so is it offensive and then also there whoever's excuse i think it was Scarborough or whatever, saying that the flag should be seen as a resistance against King George III, which is interesting. And then he also said that 85% of American millennials like seeing the U.S. flag on Independence Day. Or that was somebody else. Sorry, that was somebody else. But I don't know. I don't know that the argument that like most people aren't offended by this is a good one to have or sets a good precedent. I don't know. Maybe this argument or the, a conversation over the Betsy Ross flag isn't as serious as maybe some other things. But I don't know that that's a really good argument to make since it is often minority groups who are um, being oppressed by different things. Like maybe when we talk about something definitely offensive, like the Confederate flag or a while back in my podcast, I talk about like a statue of Columbus that was torn down. And even though maybe most Americans um, aren't offended by either of those things, it, that I mean, that's the point. It's because <laughs> most Americans are in the in the majority group and aren't haven't weren't oppressed by by Columbus as um, Native American uh, ancestors, the ancestors of Native Americans were, or, you know, the Confederate flag one is self-explanatory, I think. <laughs> um, so, yeah, this is a really interesting discussion. There's another thing that I wanted to discuss, too. Mm, I think the thing about his socks, it's such a random little detail that Kaepernick once wore socks that depicted police as pigs. And obviously, that is an intentional insult towards towards police. And he did say it wasn't towards all police officers, maybe just as a way to save face. But I think it is interesting that that is something that really upset people at the time. I I think I remember that. I remember hearing about that. um, And I'm going to reflect more on Kaepernick as a whole in general and his his activism and whatnot. But I think the the sock thing is particularly interesting because like, why are people more upset about socks than about the fact that police brutality is happening, right? Like people seem to have more issues with 
the manner in which Kaepernick is protesting than the reason that he has for protesting. So that's something I think I'm going to get more into later. But I also wanted to look at a couple articles that reconsider Colin Kaepernick. So now we have all of this information about him, his career as a football player and an activist, and kind of the toll that his activism took on his football career, which I think is is interesting um, as well. But in in recent times, um, people have been reconsidering Kaepernick. Um, I think especially the Wikipedia article mentioned after um, George Floyd's murder. I think a lot of people started reflecting on on Kaepernick and and what he was kneeling for and realizing that there was a lot of validity to it. And so um, I found a couple of interesting articles about or from some of his former teammates reflecting on this specifically as well. So this is from Yahoo Sports, <laughs> which seems like such a strange source for me to include in this podcast, but it'll be in my description if you want to read this. But Yahoo Sports says, Colin Kaepernick will be remembered for years and years and will be known for much more than his time as the 49ers quarterback. Spikes was Kaepernick's teammate on the 49ers for two seasons, 2011 and 2012, and believes the quarterback should be remembered with a statue, but at somewhere that holds much more weight than Levi Stadium. He says, I think Colin Kaepernick, I truly believe that he deserves some type of monument, a statue in the Smithsonian in D.C., Spike said to NBC Sports Bay Area's Monty Poole in a, in a podcast episode airing January 29th, 2021, uh, called Race in America, A Candid Conversation. He said, the reason why I say this is because the, this man put everything on the line. You hear the term, you can become a slave to the money, but Colin could have easily done that. But I applaud him simply because he decided to take a stand. He decided to draw a line in the sand and say, look, I can make money. I can live a carefree life for most, for the most part and get paid handsomely and never say a thing because I'm not affected. But he took the time to look back and really just see the big picture, the spectrum when we talk about inequalities. He decided not only to call it out, but to stand for it. Since protesting um, throughout the 2016 season, Kaepernick has not played a single down or been signed by an NFL team. Newly hired general manager John Lynch told Kaepernick that he would have been cut if he didn't opt out of his tr- contract in March 2017. Justina Anderson joined the latest episode of the 49ers Talk podcast and discussed the differences of how Kaepernick is viewed now as opposed to when he first began his, began his protest in 2016. I think there's more appreciation now with the sacrifice that he made in terms of raising his voice and the backlash that he absorbed as a result of that, and obviously losing his career in terms of not being able to come back to the National Football League, though I do believe he's doing well off financially. Not that that takes away from what he aspired to in finishing his career, but it certainly makes the pillow a lot softer, Anderson said. With regards to how I think things are looked at now compared to then, I would say that in a world that is post-George Floyd, I think that nationally there was a bigger awakening in terms of the differences and experiences that people of color go through when dealing with police or criminal situations or just anything that's being investigated of that sort. What I mean by that is people have a better understanding of prejudice and bias and how it affects people of color, how people of color are treated when those situations come to the point of just loss in life in ways that seem more brazen now in the era we just came off politically, even in comparison when we were under the Obama administration. I think that kind of post-George Floyd and what we just came off of politically, it really peeled back the layers of the underbelly of racism that's still out there. And it illuminated the things even more so that he was trying to bring light to. I think that there's more of an appreciation, more of an acceptance. And I think that the athletes feel more comfortable to voice their ire towards the situation. All of that I find really, really interesting. That it maybe reconsidering Kaepernick I didn't think about this before, but maybe reconsidering Kaepernick comes not just from the murder of George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter protests that we saw in 2020, but also just the Trump administration in general, day by day, seeing, being shocked, being surprised by things that would come out of his mouth or policies that he would pass, that his administration, I think, really brought um, to light the kind of racism that still exists in America. And that's something maybe Kaepernick saw and and took a stand for a lot sooner than than so many other people. So that, that is really interesting. Um, And then I have a few quotes from USA Today. Annalise Bailey writes, while reflecting on a season with former San Francisco 49ers teammate Colin Kaepernick, Alex Smith says Kaepernick's absence from football is a tragedy. He says, it's so tragic looking at it. I think Kaepernick was ahead of his time, certainly trying to call out social injustice, especially around police reform. The country wasn't ready, said Smith. Nobody was ready for it. And he's sitting there trying to tell everybody through a completely peaceful manner about some of the things going on in this country that had been going on for a long time. And to see the backlash that happened, it hurts. It hurts looking back at it. The country wasn't ready for it, and he suffered the repercussions. Yeah, so I think that's just another interesting perspective to bring into all of this. Oh, and an aspect of this, I remembered what I wanted to bring up that I didn't write down in my notes. I forget the, the statistics, but there is a, a significant number of black men in the NFL um, compared to white men. And so I think that adds another a, a kind of gravity to, to Kaepernick's protest to bring attention 
um, to the things that, that black Americans face during a football game, it kind of plays with that tension of like, do you only support black Americans when they're on a football team that you're cheering for, when you're using them for entertainment, or will you support their very lives, um, the justice that they need um, off the field as well as on the field? I think that's something that, that, that Kaepernick was causing people to wrestle with if they were paying attention to him and, and really acknowledging what he was protesting for and against. But yeah, so mm, that's interesting. I don't really know what to do with that, but I thought I'd put that out there. So I have more thoughts and reflections. I wrote down like <laughs> three pages worth, so buckle in. Um, but 2016 was just barely like five years ago, and I was younger then, <laughs> as were we all. And I don't know that I really understood at all what was going on um, when Kaepernick started getting attention for kneeling. I do remember hearing a lot of rhetoric how he shouldn't be bringing politics into football, that that wasn't the right way to protest, different things like that. And I think that's really interesting to reflect on now, that it seems like the major concerns about Kaepernick was that he was protesting in the quote unquote wrong way or like that he was ruining people's fun or something. I will admit, I did accept a lot of the rhetoric at the time. I believed those things, but I don't think it makes a lot of sense now, which is why I, I personally believe it's really important to, to reevaluate opinions that you hold or, or views that you hold because we change as people and it is nonsensical just to believe something because you've always believed it. Yeah, I don't think a lot of that rhetoric makes sense now. If you were upset with Kaepernick protesting, wouldn't it make more sense to turn your attention to the problem he was trying to bring attention to and try and find solutions for it? And then if the issues are resolved, the people don't have a reason to protest anymore. So if you did honestly think it was it was incredibly disrespectful for Kaepernick to kneel during the national anthem by seeking to solve the problems that he was protesting for, you know, then you would solve your own problem as well, right? Then he'd stop kneeling. Anyway, I find it rather eerie now that most people in 2016 were more upset about a perceived insult to the flag than the existence of police brutality. Yeah, I find that really eerie. And oftentimes, too, the fact that Kaepernick changed how he was protesting um, from sitting to kneeling to show respect to the military was totally brushed over. Like people kept saying kneeling was disrespectful to the military as well, even when they were told like, well, he's kneeling instead of sitting to try and respect the military. There was I always heard that like brushed away and being like, no, no, still not respectful, even though he talked to it like a literal veteran. But anyway. You'd think people who are so passionate about respecting Americans would be furious when they heard about what fear and havoc police brutality was doing to their fellow Americans. It just it, it's nonsensical. It's nonsensical. Another aspect of this. I agree. It would be nice if politics stayed out of entertainment and um, football and all those other things. But I don't think protesting police brutality or general oppression of black people in America is at all political. Valuing human life, seeking justice, Undoing systematic racism and oppression in our country is something that can be worked on through government processes, but those things aren't at all political, the, the value of human life, justice. And if you have a platform or a space where you can fight for those things to uplift and protect others, to bring attention to issues that other people would rather sweep under the rug, you should definitely use that platform to do so. And that's what Kaepernick did. He knew people's eyes would be on him during football games, and he took that opportunity to point to something more important than himself, more important than the game. He basically sacrificed his career, his reputation, and his very identity to do so. Yeah, I see. I think I think that's especially interesting. Kaepernick saw that he had power and influence in his platform as a football player, um, and he figured out the best way to bring attention to these issues of injustice with that platform that he had. And I think that alone is a good example to follow. Like, even if you disagree uh, with some level of this or you don't like Kaepernick for whatever reason, I think just the fact that he really recognized what power and opportunities he had and made strategic choices to use that power um, for the good of other people, I think that is an example that all of us can follow. Um, no matter if it's in the area of adv advocacy and seeking justice and expanded freedom and, and equality and equity for people, or if it's in if it's in other areas or smaller areas, using the the power and positions that we have to help other people, I think is generally admirable. So one of these articles mentioned how history reconsidered Jackie Robinson. That people didn't like him at first, but as time passed on, people began to hold him up as a hero. I think that was was really fascinating. I mentioned Jackie Robinson in one of the early episodes in this Black History Month series, and I had already started my research on Colin Kaepernick then, but I didn't put the connection between the two of them together or notice how similar they were, which I think makes sense because like, I've only ever heard good and celebratory things about Jackie Robinson. I've really never heard anything negative about him or that he was um, not supposed to be there or protesting in the wrong way or whatever, or trying to make 
baseball. He played baseball, right? I feel dumb. I think he was baseball. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> trying to make baseball about politics or whatever. But I've heard all of those things about Colin Kaepernick. I've heard a lot of negative things about Colin Kaepernick and, and things that I believe for a time, but, but don't anymore. So I think it's interesting and challenging to notice the similarities between the two of them and also the differences caused by who our contemporary is. Um, another civil rights leader that we easily celebrate now, but definitely wasn't celebrated during his time is Martin Luther King Jr. Um, and I think that's another hard thing for people to wrestle with because we always <laughs> quote Martin Luther King Jr. and listen to his I have a dream speech. I think in elementary school, I must have heard that every year. <laughs> I feel like we always focus on Dr. King for black history and civil rights history and all of this. But it's also important to remember that like, Dr. King was not as popular in his time period. He was assassinated. There were people that hated him. And that seems crazy to us now. Honestly, I don't really understand it um, because I didn't live in that time period. But I think when we see how people dislike Colin Kaepernick for reasons that, that don't seem quite logical when you start to pull them apart, I think maybe that makes more sense for Martin Luther King Jr. as well. But anyway, I was reading uh, Dr. King's letter from a Birmingham jail the other day, and I saw that he addressed some things of his nonviolent protest in that letter that also relates to Kaepernick's protests, in my opinion. You can definitely have a different perspective and different interpretation on this, but I wanted to read you some of this letter from a Birmingham jail. So Dr. King writes, you may well ask why direct action, why sit-ins, marches, and so forth? Isn't negotiation a better path? You are exactly right in your call for negotiation. Indeed, this is the purpose of direct action. Nonviolent direct action seeks to create such a crisis and establish such creative tension that a community that has consistently refused to negotiate is forced to confront the issue. It seeks so to dramatize the issue that it can no longer be ignored. I just referred to the creation of tension as a part of the work of the nonviolent resistor. This may sound rather shocking, but I must confess that I am not afraid of the word tension. I have earnestly worked and preached against violent tension, but there is a type of constructive nonviolent tension that is necessary for growth. Just as Socrates felt it was necessary to create tension in the mind so that individuals could rise from the bondage of myths and half-truths to the unfettered realm of creative analysis and objective appraisal, we must see the need of having nonviolent gadflies to create the kind of tension in society that will help men to rise from the dark depths of prejudice and racism to the majestic heights of understanding and brotherhood. So the purpose of direct action is to create a situation so crisis-packed that it will inevitably open the door to negotiation. We therefore concur with you in all in your call for negotiation. Too long has our beloved Southland been bogged down in the tragic attempt to live in monologue rather than dialogue. So I see in some of these quotes here similarities between Dr. King's efforts and Kaepernick's. Doesn't kneeling on national television dramatize the issue of police brutality for viewers who have never had direct interaction with it? Doesn't it create a kind of tension, a kind of unavoidable conversation, grabbing the the attention and the minds of, of people who have refused to participate in negotiations and find solutions outside of getting mixed up with football games and football players and television and all that. So and anyway, Dr. King continues. He says, one of the basic points in your statement is that our acts are untimely. Some have asked, why didn't you give the new administration time to act? The only answer that I can give to this inquiry is that the new administration must be prodded about as much as the outgoing one before it acts. My friends, I must say to you that we have not made a single gain in civil rights without determined legal and nonviolent pressure. History is the long and tragic story of the fact that privileged groups seldom give up their privileges voluntarily. Individuals must see the moral light and voluntarily give up their unjust posture. But as Reinhold Niebuhr has reminded us, groups are more immoral than individuals. So this, again, in my opinion, relates back to Kaepernick. People question the necessity of him kneeling at all, suggesting that the drama and the tension he was creating was only for himself to gain attention or whatever because he wasn't like the best football player or something. I don't know. People thought that there was no reason for him to kneel because racism doesn't exist in America anymore. But doesn't that point to exactly the reason for why he was kneeling? Because otherwise people wouldn't be aware of the oppression of black Americans. The, the oppression that black Americans face, like he's kneeling to bring to that attention. So if you think that his kneeling is unnecessary because it doesn't exist, like that only supports it. Do you understand what I'm saying? I feel like this is a bit of a loop, <laughs> but it makes sense in my head. Um, so many people refuse to hear or see injustices in this country, but they eagerly watch football every Sunday. So like what better place to help them open their eyes than in the midst of something they are willing to watch and pay attention to? If they're not willing to pay attention to police brutality and they are willing to pay attention to football. That, I mean, that makes, makes football a great place to teach people to bring attention to 
to this issue. It's not going to be an easy conversation. It's not a simple confrontation with the facts because people don't like being told that their perspectives are limited or wrong. Dr. King said that not a single gain has been made in civil rights without pressure. And that was clearly something that Kaepernick was cognizant of as well. Back to the letter from a Birmingham jail. We know through painful experience that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. Frankly, I have never yet engaged in a direct action movement that was quote-unquote well-timed according to the timetable of those who have not suffered unduly from the disease of segregation. For years now, I have heard the word wait. It rings in the ear of every Negro with a piercing familiarity. This wait has almost always meant never. It has been tranquilizing, relieving the emotional stress for a moment, only to give birth to an ill-formed infant of frustration. We must come to see with the distinguished jurist of yesterday that quote, justice too long delayed is justice denied. We have waited more than 340 years for our God-given and constitutional rights. There comes a time when the cup of endurance runs over and men are no longer willing to be plunged into an abyss of injustice, where they experience the bleakness of corroding despair. I hope, sirs, you can understand our legitimate and unavoidable impatience. So I feel like this is something that had been attributed to to Kaepernick as well. Like, he's doing it at the wrong time. I I think there there was more criticism about him bringing in um, protests to a football game, but I kind of already addressed that. But as far as like, was Kaepernick kneeling at the wrong time? Should he have changed his protest or waited and, and protested like now in 2020, like now that things are moving or, you know, is was maybe Kaepernick's um, kneeling and protesting just the first step? Would people have been paying attention? Would people have been aware as much if Kaepernick hadn't introduced them to this topic, to the issue of police brutality by the time that George Floyd was murdered? Would that have caused such a big big reaction? And as far as like Black Lives Matter protests go, um, if Kaepernick wasn't starting that tension and and starting um, bringing attention to those things. And so I think that's really interesting. And this is also a bit of of a tangent, but I also wanted to address this mythic ability of time that people tend to believe in, especially when it comes to civil rights and these other things. Um, And this is something that Dr. King definitely addressed, but I kind of wanted to say it again in another way, because I heard um, elsewhere this week, I don't remember exactly where, maybe like a podcast or something, um, but people have this tendency to believe in the mythical abilities of time, that things are guaranteed to change along with the passage of time. And all we have to do is sit back and wait. Things will change. Things will get better if we just let time pass. But that's not true. That's not remotely at all true. Time is neither good nor bad. It just is. Things don't improve or fall apart because of the passage of time. Things only change based on what we do with our time. Whether we choose to step up, to take action, to change things, or whether we sit back and let things stay as they are because we're too unbothered or too foolish to see the opportunities and responsibilities we have in each and every one of our short days on this earth. So, (laughs) sorry, got a little intense there at the end. That's all I've got for you guys today. Thank you so much for sleuthing with me. I hope you enjoyed this episode and are empowered to maybe reevaluate some things you heard or used to understand about Colin Kaepernick and um, are empowered to see in in what ways you can take a stand for other people with the the power and the platforms that you have in your day-to-day life. Um, The featured Black History podcast of this episode is Black Her Story 101. Definitely check them out to learn more about Black women in Black history and have an all-around great listening experience. I will put a link to this podcast in my description as well as the other sources that I used for this episode. All right, I will catch you guys on Tuesday. Back to regularly scheduled history sleep episodes. Um, Don't forget to follow me wherever you get your podcasts so you don't miss the next episode and rate and review when you can. I hope you guys have a absolutely wonderful day. Goodbye.